Thank you to all of you and uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're having this uh, terrific uh, group meeting here today and pay my respects uh, to elders past and present and any elders who may be certainly with us here today. Uh, and I'd also, of course, uh, like to acknowledge uh, the fact that uh, I'm, I'm jumping a little bit ahead of uh, in the speaking order, but I, I certainly want to uh, certainly give my respects to Daryl Taylor, who will be presenting, I believe, uh, after me, uh, who will give us uh, his first-hand account experiences of uh, uh, how community members, how organisations uh, have dealt with uh, the bushfires here in Victoria and certainly some reflections on uh, the floods in Queensland. Uh, I've been asked to speak on local, state and federal governments working in partnerships uh, to rebuild communities and partnerships is, I suppose, uh, uh, a catchphrase that uh, is very true uh, to my heart and uh, because uh, with uh, partnerships and understanding uh, the equal nature of that, that term, I think we can all achieve a great deal in our community and uh, certainly instil a greater sense of ownership of where we go uh, as a community and the consequences of that are uh, good and bad. And I think once we understand that, uh, then I think we all have uh, a greater uh, responsibility uh, for the outcomes of uh, how our community fares uh, into the future. Uh, what the Victorian fires have made very clear uh, to us in government is how crucial those partnerships are in dealing with large-scale emergencies. In Victoria, those partnerships included everything from matching dollar-for-dollar dollar contribution to the Bushfire Recovery Fund from the state and federal governments, uh, and the work that the Army did with firefighters and the police on the ground, to the support that the Victorian government provided for local councils in fire-affected areas, and the shared distribution systems for goods and services that were donated by communities and by businesses, and most of which were very spontaneous. There were undoubtedly many areas where we will need to do better in any future crisis. Uh, and I know that Daryl will reflect uh, very heavily on where we can do better and the lessons that we've learned uh, from the crises that we've encountered of late. But what I'd like to do this morning is share four of our key learnings from what happened in February. The first learning is about the need to have systems that can harness people's overwhelming desire to help after an emergency. And no doubt each and every one of you, like myself, will be able to recount uh, the, the flood of, of uh, assistance and, uh, and questions of, well, how can I help uh, in the situations that uh, confronted us in February. In the weeks after the fire, the government set up a volunteer registration service for the more than 20,000 Victorians who said they wanted to help in some way. We also set up a donation coordination service to help match the offers of goods and services that came pouring in with local community needs. For example, there was uh, 500,000 tonnes of food aid provided to people affected by the fires and there were 10,000 offers of accommodation. That's pretty big. Uh, when you just look at those, uh, those offers, you think, well, wow, you know, people's hearts certainly did open up. Uh, and it, it really does remind us of uh, how people do genuinely and spontaneously feel a part of their broader community when those types of crises happen. And I remember myself uh, saying uh, to a number of people around me at the time, and I, I couldn't help but say it sometimes, that you know, unfortunately it takes these types of disasters to really know the people who really rise up to it, and perhaps the, the small number who perhaps fall a little bit short of it. But what was certainly overwhelming is that the numbers uh, and swells of people who actually rose to the occasion, if you like. And uh, that really, I think, um, reinforces uh, or certainly holds up uh, the sense of community that we actually do have. And, and I think it's salutary for us to reflect on that whenever sometimes we say, well, you know, it's not like the old days, whenever the old days may have been. The fact is um, we are still a very resilient community uh, and that's something that we need to build on and take great comfort in uh, and know that uh, certainly the prospects uh, for volunteering and community building uh, certainly are there for us well and truly for the future. And, and those two 
two figures alone, as I've said, the 500,000 tonnes of food aid and the 10,000 offers of accommodation, those two figures alone give us a good sense of the logistical challenge uh, that confronted us. We also learned that it is incredibly important to be able to cut through the red tape and regulations that often inhibits community action. And no doubt some of you will be able to recount a number of those uh, barriers, if you like, uh, or little hurdles along the way to uh, community action. That can mean something as straightforward as removing the need for planning permits to clear land uh, that had been burned by fire. But it also means being as flexible as possible about emergency funding arrangements. And one good example of that flexibility uh, as possible about emergency funding arrangements is the extra support we provided neighbourhood houses in fire affected areas. And uh, I'm sure all of you will be aware about what neighbourhood houses are. Uh, and there are about 360 of them across Victoria, providing a range of social, educational and recreational activities for their local communities. For that reason, they played a very important role in the recovery effort from day one. And they were often the place for a lot of families to turn to uh, in the most crucial days uh, subsequent to the bushfires. Early on, we fast-tracked $10,000 in funding to each of the 21 houses affected by fires to help them respond to the needs of their local community. And that extra funding was totally flexible in how it could be spent. The third learning is really just a reinforcement of what anyone working in the community sector already knows. And that learning is about the importance of having good coordination and clearly designated responsibilities of who does what. Without good coordination, there is a huge potential for resources to be wasted and opportunities to be missed. Of course, getting that coordination isn't always easy, uh, especially at moments of unexpected crisis. It often requires organisations to be prepared to work in new ways and with new groups of people. And that can be, certainly be a challenge for government, as it can be, of course, for community organisations. Even with good coordination, it can still be hard for people to navigate their way through the range of services that are available. And that was one of the reasons we offered a government case manager to each person, each group of families uh, affected by the fires. And 12 weeks after the fires, there were more than 5,000 families and individuals helped by case managers. The fourth learning is about the value of local planning. As we moved into the rebuilding phase, we have tried to involve local communities as much as possible in planning and local decision making. The Victorian Bushfire Relief and Recovery Authority has established a process for local communities to have direct input into decisions about the future of their communities. As we rebuild, there are also some great opportunities to pr improve how services and facilities are provided to communities. For example, that could mean creating a new shared facility that brings a number of services or groups together under the one roof. And many of those ideas come out of local community planning processes. And I think it's also important for me to note at this point that one of the, uh, at least one of the, uh, the uh, key bushfire areas that, uh, that uh, was under attack, the King Lake area, and no others including Ballara, uh, that uh, we had uh, already as a government uh, funded community building initiative programs in each of those. And they're about basically getting communities to determine for themselves what their priorities are, uh, what their needs are and how to actually go about uh, sourcing funds uh, and identifying opportunities opportunities for, for sourcing funds to actually build those things that uh, are most dear and needed to them. So these are the four learnings from the Victorian bushfires and I think many of them uh, would also help apply to the way that we respond to other crises uh, and that could be events like drought or flood of course. But it's equally uh, important that uh, it could be events like the global financial crisis that presents us with many other types of crises. Uh, many of the learnings I've just discussed also have particular relevance to the community sector. So, for example, during the bushfires, we found that we needed better systems to harness the desire of Victorians to help people affected by the bushfires. But we also need new ways of supporting volunteering beyond the bushfires. In Victoria, more than one million people volunteer every year. That's a very sizable number of people. And despite the media image of Generation Y, young people are still very keen to be volunteers. And what is happening is that volunteering is changing. And that's something that we need to appreciate and uh, take hold of if we are to grow 
uh, and and facilitate the desire of uh, many young people to to uh, to take part in volunteering activities. We know that people want to volunteer in different ways. So young people, for example, often see volunteering as a way of developing their work skills and or experience, and that's a very legitimate thing. And there is a growing group, of course, of older Australians who have left the workforce, but who are still very interested in staying active in their community and have, of course, much experience and knowledge to offer. What we need to do, of course, is help organisations that depend on volunteers to adjust to these new patterns of volunteering. And that means helping them to recruit new groups of volunteering of volunteers. It also means helping them to develop or extend the work their volunteers do. It also means helping them to extend volunteer networks into new areas, particularly in the new suburbs on the edges of Melbourne. And in this year's uh, state budget, we've committed to putting more than $9 million into Victoria's new volunteering strategy. The response um, to the fires also showed the importance of cutting through the red tape, as I mentioned earlier, that often inhibits community actions. There have been, uh, there's been a major effort by the Commonwealth and state governments to reduce the cost of regulation and business. And um, I'm pleased to say that the Victoria has been very much at the forefront of doing that. And we know that regulation isn't only a cost uh, on businesses, but it's also uh, an impact, has a, a significant impact on community organisations. That's why we've asked our new off Victorian office for the community sector to look at how we could cut those costs in Victoria. And that means certainly looking at how we can simplify the requirements of fundraising and incorporation. It also means simplifying the demands put on community organisations that receive funding from government. And that means less time on the bureaucratic uh, red tape and more time on what you actually want to achieve as an organisation. The bushfires also showed how important it is to have good coordination between services and government agencies. And that demand for better coordination is just as important as we respond to other major, major challenges, as I've mentioned, including the global financial crises. That means that government must continue to build good knowledge and understanding about the community sector. And that, of course, is more easily derived when we talk about partnerships and we act like we are in partnership with community organisations. This is another task that we've asked the Office for the Community Sector to work on. The Office for the Community Sector has started to assess the effect of the global financial crisis on community organisations. Coordinated responses by government and the sector will be needed to address this and other emerging issues. The final learning I've mentioned uh, earlier was about the value of community planning. We know that community involvement in planning and decision making can be an incredibly powerful tool. And I've seen that, of course, uh, through uh, my visits to the 19 community building initiative projects around the state that I mentioned earlier. And uh, if I can just elaborate a little bit more on what community building initiatives program is about, 19 projects that are working with 100 small communities right across Victoria. And they are communities that are going through very rapid change. There are either rapid change in uh, decreases in population, especially in rural areas, but also through economic disadvantage and the like. And uh, one of those townships uh, that I know that Daryl Taylor will elaborate on later is uh, King Lake. And uh, all of the projects are very different in what they aim to do. It's certainly the long way around state governments working with communities, but I know from, from uh, the evidence on the ground that is, it is the best way of identifying what the needs are uh, at local levels and finding resources to match those needs. And one story I like to tell every now and then, and I suppose it's a bit of a lesson in community development that I learned very early on, even though I, I don't have official proper training, if you like, in community development, but it's certainly a lesson I think that, that uh, you will uh, recognise uh, very quickly is uh, a story of a, a migrant uh, from, from Britain who came over from Manchester a number of years ago to settle in Australia. And she, she told me a story of... Um, uh, growing up in a particular area of Manchester where government, uh, must have been the local council at the time there because they've got certainly different systems of operating, decided it was a great idea to, to build a, a series of tennis courts uh, for the local impoverished kids. And uh, there was you know, a big fanfare about it. Uh, there was a wonderful uh, opening of the tennis courts. But uh, what was forgotten, of course, is where these kids were going to get tennis rackets and tennis balls. Uh, so now it's... It's something that can certainly 
uh, bring about a little bit of humour in the, in the telling of the story, but it's quite salutary in the way that we all need to operate uh, and understand how communities function and identifying the needs. Uh, and when you identify the needs uh, through local dialogue uh, from the ground up, that's when you get the best matching of resources to, to needs in any community. And uh, for me, that is the best way to go uh, in any uh, community building uh, projects. So all these projects, as I mentioned, the community building initiatives are very different in, the, in what they aim to do, and so they should be. But what they all share is uh, bringing local community members together to develop a community plan, and then identifying how resources can be marshaled to turn those plans into reality. And these are critical outcomes that help communities rebuild, certainly after crises. These are just some examples of a much larger picture. And in that bigger picture, our community building initiatives projects uh, have attracted more than $8 million in extra funding as a result of partnerships with more than 500 organisations. Now, those funding dollars aren't necessarily from state government. They're from state, they're from federal, they're from local, and they're also from private sector. That's a real demonstration of how valuable community planning can be. So these are just some of the learnings that have come out of the terrible events that have happened uh, in February. A common theme that underpins all of them is the importance of partnerships between different levels of government and with the community. The cost of rebuilding communities is beyond, is beyond one level of government alone. The complexity of rebuilding communities is also beyond one level of government. These types of crises require the skills and the networks that the community sector has. We have seen those skills and networks on display in Victoria, and uh, certainly I suspect that they will also have been on display during the Queensland floods uh, around the same time of year. And that is why I want to thank you all for the work that you do in communities right across Australia. And I certainly would like to thank you for the opportunity to be here today in, to, in sharing uh, uh, the learnings that you no doubt will bring to the rest of the forum. And I certainly wish you well for the rest of the Communities in Control Conference and thank you very much again.